you have really been in this space for a long time and you started many businesses under the realm of, I would say, wellness and well-being. I feel like from the outside, you are someone who is 10 steps ahead of everyone else. You see the trend before anyone else notices it, almost to the point that you're like early sometimes. Can you talk a little bit about and trace maybe the evolution of the wellness market, for lack of a better term, since you kind of like stepped into the ring? Mm, yeah, thank you for that acknowledgement, because I think we we share a lot of that. It's been really interesting because for me, this journey as an entrepreneur within the quote unquote wellness space, which did not exist when I started, has been an intuitive one and has been one that's been specifically linked to just what I felt was needed for my own well-being and what was offered. And then where where that gap was is where I pursued to fill in the gap. So it was like, okay, I I'm committed to prioritizing well-being and to creating any of those solutions that are missing for myself and for anyone who that resonates with. And so it's been really interesting because there was a vacuum for a long time in the wellness space. So many of the things that are completely normal were things that people had never even thought about 10 years ago. And and some of those things looking back were the things that I spearheaded. And that's it's kind of wild to like recognize that, <laughs> but a lot of this space has been really innovation in a vacuum and nobody cared about what we were doing for many years. And I would say the turning point was most likely around, I'd say 2015 when that started to slightly tilt to the more mainstream interest. And then 2020, everything just ramped up exponentially. Yeah. I think that the election of Trump, well, probably 2015 were like the sort of pre-Trump era. Um, yes. And then the election of Trump was, where the height of self-care as a sort of term in the zeitgeist, I think, really came into focus because so many people were blindsided by the like deeply emotional experience of basically recognizing that women and people of color, like the United States hates women <laughs> so much that they would yeah. like their vote for Donald Trump and <laughs> then Hillary Clinton, what it felt like, right? Yeah. And so many of our freedoms and support systems that we believe in were, were deeply threatened. And I think that that was really traumatizing for a lot of people at that time. And self-care as an act of resistance, which is a term that was coined by Black feminists long ago, came back into the zeitgeist with like such vigor, vigor, but from a wellness industry perspective. How has this idea of self-care kind of evolved. You've really seen it. Like you said, you came to wellness to care for yourself, right? How have you seen that evolve and shift over time? And, and where do you think we are now with the idea of self-care? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I love how you traced this like random number of 2015 to pre-Trump, like Trump and Hillary era. Like I didn't even, I didn't even think about that, but you're so spot on that those those timelines are definitely coinciding um, with real meaning. And yeah, I mean, in terms of self-care, especially over the past few years, I think there's a, there's a few different things that are, that are happening for me. I mean, I, my individual life and, and our generation as millennials, we were given very different opportunities than the generations before us and namely women. And, and then on top of that, being a woman of color. And so the fact that I was able to live in a, an apartment in the East Village by myself as a single black female in her early 20s in the early aughts, like that alone is a unique experience. Like that is, I would walk into my building knowing that I was the first person like me to live like that in this building on that block. Wow. So just like to kind of like give that greater context of like, there are so many experiences that we have that I have that literally no one has ever been able to have being in our in our bodies or our likeness in the past. And so with that, there's an interesting confluence that I find that has happened where it's like I've been given and, and I also have like worked to have an incredible amount of opportunity and access and with that have also experienced an incredible amount of hardship and struggle. 
So it's like this really interesting confluence of opportunity meets like oppression (laughs) in a way that historically we've never had. And so what I found was really important for me was to stay on this like unique path of being able to be a seeker, not being um, held to like religious beliefs that uh, my family or my community would impose upon me. And then also having to find these like innate um, ways to deal with being in this world of privilege, but also being oppressed at the same time. And so I just wanted to kind of give that larger context, because for me, that's been kind of the polarity that I've had to grapple with this entire time. And I still do now that I have kind of risen out of having such financial struggle like I did when I first started to pursue what's called self-care, I'm really still aware that there's such a huge disparity with being able to live well fully as a Black woman, as a woman of color, as a person living in this country, no matter my gender or ethnicity. And so I, I, I really um, believe in like that greater context being present because Yes, um, self care in the United States costs a lot of money usually. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and, and if not, and if not the things like reading, which is also self care or hiking or, or, you know, um, drinking water, even that to be able to enjoy the luxury of those most simple self care practices is a luxury in this country. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to grapple all of that. And I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I'm sure there's some good sound bites in there. <laughs> no, I, I think that that was what you articulated so beautifully of your own experience. I think many people feel like and felt of, well, I know I, I have the, this immense privilege. I have access. I have the Internet. I have all these things at my fingertips. Right. But I also still feel like something's not right. Like, why is this so hard? I wouldn't necessarily say probably before the Trump era that we are like a deeply misogynistic country until it's almost like slapped across your face. Right. That like, oh, we're still deeply racist and we're still deeply, you know, sexist and and kind of like under like almost like sensing it, like smelling it, getting a whiff of it every now and then and being like, yeah, but we're but like we're evolved and like I'm not oppressed or, you know, I don't I don't. I'm not marginalized anymore, you know, women's rights or that doesn't exist in our country when it it actually so deeply does because it's systemic. It's um, almost like cognitive dissonance. And that's exhausting to like try and keep up with. I think that as a result, especially sort of in the around 2015, 2016 era, self-care as a buzzword term kind of turned into like baths and crystals and <laughs> managers, you know, and like making a matcha and like doing a puzzle. And that's a very sort of like individualist and capitalistic consumer perspective on self care and yes. what wellness, quote unquote, is, right? And I don't think it's a coincidence that around that time, wellness on Instagram was a lot of smoothie bowls, a lot of, uh, you know, like flying lotus poses on whatever. Um, <laughs> and, and like a, you know, a beautiful matcha with a bunch of crystals next to it. And you are, you have a, an incredible social media presence. Can you talk a little bit about like living through that era of Instagram online, uh, Instagram and wellness online? Oh, man, it's 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 wild to witness. I mean, and to even go back to <laughs> the Instagram <laughs> accounts that were popular because there were amazing yoga poses that were posted every day. I mean, I remember producing Rooftop Yoga in 2012 and the, that year or the next year using this thing called Instagram to show how beautiful it was on that rooftop to do yoga yeah. there. I mean, it was I actually have the first picture, I think, still posted on my Instagram if anybody wants to go and see that because it was really a phenomenon like, oh, my gosh, like we can share these images with people who aren't just our people and just people that we don't know can see this. And that was really um, interesting. But yeah, I think, you know, I have a really interesting relationship with Instagram, especially now because I am grateful for what it has done. I'm grateful. I mean, (laughs) there's just so many benefits to what has come from Instagram that it's, it's really hard for me to poo poo how much I actually dislike it. Um, mm-hmm. and I would say one of those things is the, the ability for one, whether that's a yoga teacher who was doing naked yoga poses on the beach or me who was, uh, producing rooftop yoga and, and, and the list continues. 
I think the fact that we could build our own communities globally without having to have a middleman or a middle person, if you will. And so, you know, even just thinking about my time as a model and, and on television, you know, I was just telling someone the other day that so much of my career as a model relied on someone giving me a job and then, then giving me uh, credibility mm-hmm. and then giving me a following that would support that credibility. But now with Instagram, you can build that for yourself and then brands respond, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that, that shift in dynamic is really important for why the, the industries of both fashion and wellness have diversified because people mm-hmm. have to respond to influence <laughs> no matter what the systems at play are saying is influential or cool. The market is now determining that. So I know that there are things like algorithms that are now skewing that and that that's a whole weird game. But I think for me watching what's happened over the years, specifically on Instagram with wellness, it was frustrating for a lot of those years watching um, influencers grow because they were showing their, their salad bowls and their smoothies And yet, at the same time, I was aware that they were doing me a favor because while I might consider myself a healer and that we're doing the serious stuff, the truth Mm -hmm. is those smoothie bowl accounts were helping bring in people to do yoga for the very first time. I remember being in classes where people had never done yoga before. Like the majority of the class Mm -hmm. would raise their hand and say, we've never done yoga. And that was in New York City. So can you imagine what that was like in Pittsburgh or the middle of, you know, the United States. So, so I have to say like those yoga teachers who were doing (laughs) naked yoga on the, on the beaches, which I was friends with, I, (laughs) I'm also grateful to them because they brought in people that would have never been interested in some of the, the deeper rabbit hole things that we were doing. So it's a weird um, balance, just like, you know, just like everything that we're, that we're walking the line of right now. Yeah, that's such a good point. And something that we're going to talk about in this series is that Instagram and I would say like wellness as an industry um, have really been sort of like looked down upon as silly or something flippant. That's for silly girls, you know, like it's almost we've been able to kind of fly under the radar and build power in these spaces that people who are in power think are dumb. And, (laughs) you know, you know, you know, if if men were the ones who had really gotten big on on Instagram initially, I don't think the term influencer would exist. We'd just be calling them master marketers. Right. But we have to sort of like denigrate. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, We have to we have to sort of like cut down women naturally, especially women who are really good at something and hold power. And I, I kind of feel like Instagram and wellness in a way are sort of like the Trojan horse for many people to yes. get credibility, like you said, you know, to build credibility yes. in an industry. And yes. I'm curious now that wellness, I guess, is sort of like acceptable for all. What do you think that that means and what's kind of next for the way that that power structure exists? Like, do you mm-hmm. think that this will be overrun by white men? This space will be overrun by white men at some point? Mm. Yeah, it's really, it's a really interesting question because, you know, I, from time to time, VCs will reach out to me and it's mm-hmm. so evident that they don't get what the hell I'm doing and that it's absolutely not a fit to have <laughs> and like to have a VC invest in my company no matter how right. profitable we are, you know, and how big we get. It's just like, though it just does not match. And it's funny because, of course, you and I both know uh, wellness companies that have been invested in by VCs. And some of that ends up not going so well. And I wouldn't even, I don't even want to list them because I know some of them and I'm sure they'll hear it. But, but they, but I think the, the contrast of like, there's something inherent about what, really is behind wellness. And that is that it's not actually a corporate capitalist system. That like what's really behind this like thing that we're calling the industry of wellness is actually spirituality based in community and real connection. And there's no amount of capitalism that's going to wash that away for that core base of who makes this industry what this industry is, right? Mm -hmm. And so what's really challenging for me and what, what I'm really actually, there's a big question mark for the future of this industry 
And I use air quotes because, again, it was not an industry for literally centuries. And all of a sudden it became an industry that was validated by capitalism Mm -hmm. and by like older white men in offices. It, It seems like it seems like we're just going to continue to have um like these like almost like tribal factions that are going to break up in this industry and there's going to be people who are financed by the VCs and who who you know uh become the the Lululemons of the world publicly traded companies and all of that and then there's going to be people like I think you and I who who don't need to go public who who can launch their own DAOs who can uh, launch their own um, uh, uh, products and, and community shared value ideas and entities and will become just as big and or will serve the same needs that that community needs, just like Lululemon would be able to for their investors and their publicly traded like stockholders. So I think I think we're just going to have more factions. They're going to break off. And what I'm excited about personally, I mean, I. I, I walk this line of like, no, I understand that capitalism has all of its problems. I understand that I'm constantly having to uh, struggle in that system. And I know that I'm in it and I, I and mm-hmm. I live in a house and I use the Internet and all of those things. So I'm going to use it to serve the agenda that I believe will be most beneficial for my community and for the people who are seeking what I'm seeking. And so with that in mind, it's like, yes, I plan on using the technology that will serve our community to be prosperous and healthy and connected and truly feeling like we have a place, not just in this industry, but in this world. And I think that that's what's possible now, not because of the corporate capitalists that are in the wellness industry, but because people like myself, people like you are using tools without feeling like we need permission anymore. We don't need permission. We have the thousand plus diehard loyal community members. And and in our case, more than a thousand. And that is more than enough for a true business, but not just a true business, but an actual movement. So I think we'll see those factions break off. And I think we'll see that we won't actually need some of those capitalist structures to help us still work within capitalism in a meaningful way for us. (laughs) As you're speaking, you reminded me of Something that I admire so much about you is that you were a bridge builder and mm. that gave me truth tingles when I said it. Thank you. You really are, though, in so many different ways when it comes to accessibility in the wellness space and like making well- wellness not just for rich white people, for bringing more people into this space. You've really chosen conscientiously to build bridges as opposed to having an isolationist or segregationist perspective of I'm only going to build something for people that look like me. Um, And I think that that's really admirable because I think it's often more challenging to hold your integrity close to the chest, to stay in in alignment with your integrity and your values when, and to continue to work in systems like capitalism, right? To sort of like, be myopic makes it easy. When you say no to everything, of course you can be like in alignment with yourself, but you also, it's going to take a lot longer to see the change that you want to, you want to see in the world. Right. And I feel like you've chosen the more difficult path in the path that really requires strength, strength of conviction to be able to be a bridge um, and use the tools at your disposal to, to like advance what it is that you're trying to do to help as many people as you possibly can can you talk a little bit more about how you've come to that determination? Like how did you decide that being a bridge builder was the way to do it as opposed to being like, fuck this wellness space. I'm going to make my own thing. Mm, Thank you. I always really appreciate your acknowledgement, Michelle. It really means a lot to me. And I would say one of the things that comes up is that some of it is, I don't think I really had a choice. I mean, yes, I could have just been like, forgetful of uh where I came from and and the community that helped build me up I could I could have just left them behind so I guess yeah in some ways that that is easy and we see that happen a lot but I think you know being a mixed race person who lived all over the country who 
on my dad's side and first generation American. There's just so many things about who I am that is literally the story that, that you just shared. Like I am literally representing the planet by just existing because of how many different bloodlines are in my freaking body. So there's like an inherent like compassion for like personally understanding what it's like to be marginalized, but also personally understanding what it's like to have immense privilege because I can't leave that part out. I was raised by a white family and I lived all over the United States. So there's, there's a lot that comes with that, that a lot of people don't have. And so again, just like both things being true, I recognize that I, what I, what really was the turning point, Michelle, was that I would be in rooms like the Soho houses in New York or in London, or I'd be at these like exclusive parties and I'd realize that there was literally not one other person of color around me, let alone the yoga studios, let alone the meditation retreats. There was not literally not even one person that was of color anywhere. And that's when I realized this is fucked up. Excuse my French, but like, this is not, this is not okay. And literally, if this is going to change, because I'm literally the only person of color, let alone black person, but person of color Mm -hmm. at said yoga studio in New York or London or just even events or conferences, then, then I have to be the one that helps more people of color come here. And not even just people of color, because my mom's side of the family who are white are from Oklahoma and Kansas. So also thinking about white folks who just don't have access to like, quote unquote, elitist leftist communities in New York and London and LA. And so really thinking about that and being inclusive meant to me that like, wow, clearly nobody else cares about it. Somehow I got in. And so if anybody else is going to change this, it has to be me because nobody else looks like me around here. And so that has kind of been the process again and again and again. And and I have to say, nobody cared for a long time. I mean, no joke, Michelle, nobody gave a shit until 2020. That's why I I, I tell people, I'm like, sometimes you got to look at people's accounts before, before March of 2020, because nobody cared about diversity when I was talking to them about it in major press um, interviews or podcasts. In fact, they cut that out. Mm-hmm. And I would insist that they'd include my, my, my like tirade about how important diversity and inclusion was in wellness and culture in general. So it's really important for us to recognize that it's okay that some of us didn't notice or care. It's okay. We have to, we have to forgive ourselves for that. We have to forgive others for that. And we have to really be sure that when we are working in this world, that we're working with people who actually do care and not because it's a signal, not because it's cool, not because it's a brand move. And so, yeah, for me, that's just been like, it's been hard because nobody did care until two years ago. And, and great. Now I get to benefit from that. And I'm still very cautious about why people are doing what they do and if they really, truly understand the meaning of inclusion and diversity and its importance in in our culture. Mm. We're hitting all the points that I think are like salient and important. And on the evolution of sort of like the quote unquote wellness industry, I wonder if there's a different word we should be using. I wonder if there's like, yes, you know, it just needs a whole new like title. And I think that the movement that we're going into is that well-being is holistic. Everything contributes Mm. to our well-being. And so people who really I think are going to be at the forefront of this space will be intrinsic in their values that inclusion matters, that equity matters because that contributes to our communal well-being. So it won't be like a sort of tacked on afterthought or like a trying to look good or whatever. It's got to be in the DNA of whatever comes next. 100%. I mean, holisticism might be a good replacement for the world world of wellness. (laughs) That might be a word we have to all adopt to give you some pride, girl. But no, I I 100% agree. I think things are shifting and people are shifting to recognize, like you said, that everything is about your well-being. And it's not just this narrow checkoff list of what you did for yourself today. It's actually a whole lifestyle. And when you recognize that, you then see how much in our systems and and, in our society are actually antithesis to that. Just thinking about something as simple as water. And how in L.A. you're not supposed to drink the tap water. That 
is impactful on our individual well-being, but also our collective and communal well-being. And so there's there's things like that that are once really small and just like, oh, we can deal with it, whatever, to, oh, wow, if we live a life where well-being is our priority and our way of being, then all of those things matter. And they don't matter just for us, but they matter for everyone. Yeah. I mean, great point. The water in L.A. I also think about like transportation in L.A. And if we had a really? more robust public transit system, first off, people who experience time poverty and that contributes to their well-being or their lack thereof. Right. Oh, if I don't if I'm commuting three hours a day because there's not a direct way to get to where I need to go yes. public transit in yes. L.A., then that means that I'm, I'm not able to like probably grocery shop um, the way that I want to or spend time with my kids the way that I want to yes. or or exercise uh, like I'm spending a lot of time stuck doing this thing and then like the also environmental elements of while well, we all have to be in cars that's not great for us as a community yes. um but yeah when we start to look at it through that lens, lens of well-being instead like like you said yeah there are so many shifts that need to happen and it's and it rip the ripple is not just well we're all going to be more well we're all going to be more rested it's like <laughs> more than totally. that, you know totally that's what makes this even more challenging now, because when we go from wellness as an industry, we're talking about smoothies and, and tubs and bathtubs and, and beautiful bath bombs. But when we're talking about, you know, well-being as a lifestyle, then, yes, it starts to cross over into geopolitical, socioeconomic structures that matter. I mean, honestly, girl, as we were talking about this, I was like, this is a whole book. This is a whole ongoing conversation. I'm so glad that you're doing this. So thank you. This is this is a great place to stop because there's so much more that we could do. Well, it's been I'm really excited for this series. It's like as a projector, love to just like research and see everything and how everything contributes to everything. And like, yeah, it's an, it's been incredible. I mean, it's incredible that we're at this point and I can't wait to see what happens next and how quickly the industry is changing. And I think like, you know, yes. what we're working on next is very is it like it's cool. I'm excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. You know us, girl. Just a little bit early, but always on time. <laughs> so for the listeners who aren't familiar with patriarchy stress disorder, how would you define it with, you know, the historical concept leading up to how we see it most active today. Absolutely. Women have been oppressed for thousands of years. Our bodies did not belong to us. Our lives did not belong to us. We didn't have sovereignty over our decisions, didn't have parental rights of our own children. We could not love who we loved. We could not marry for love. We could not get a divorce, could not make our own money could not show up in our wisdom, in our genius, in our sexuality in the world. All of that was prohibited, dangerous, persecuted. Traumatic, in short. Really, really traumatic (laughs) for thousands of years, right? And now we know from the science of epigenetics that trauma is genetically transmitted. So what I have termed patriarchy stress disorder is intergenerational trauma of oppression that serves as the invisible inner barrier to women's ultimate success, happiness, and fulfillment today. Absolutely. There's a passage in your book that stands out as particularly poignant relating to women living under patriarchy today. I'll just read it back to you for a second. For women living under patriarchy, these survival instructions include be seen and not heard. Don't be too sexy, too loud, too smart, too rich, too visible, too powerful. Powerful women are burned at the stake, or as my mother used to warn me, no one would want to marry you. (laughs) Can you tell us more about really how wellness might be viewed as an unthreatening profession for women under patriarchy? Because it's a softer, kind of more emotional and really understanding why the explosion of wellness as an industry was kind of a safe way for women to enter the workforce and gain independence because it's under the guise of, you know, family values and and health Mm -hmm. and nurturing. 
Yeah, absolutely. Women are wired for nurturance, but that's not the only thing that we're wired for. <laughs> we're also wired for pleasure. We're also brilliant in every way. Our intelligence is very multifaceted. But to what you pointed out, yes, there has been a lot more patriarchal allowance, I guess, for women to play in certain fields like teachers, nurses, and the current incarnation that kind of combines the two <laughs> yeah. is wellness. You know, it's an interesting thing where, yes, women are healers, and it's a beautiful, beautiful avenue to bring our healing talents to the world. I see where the wellness industry goes off track, in my view, is where it gets hijacked by patriarchal norms. And this is mm -hmm. just so, so painful, and it's unconscious. I do not believe any of the players in the industry are consciously perpetrating patriarchal norms and the trauma that comes with that. But it is unconscious and it is dangerous as such. So if we get to shed some light on some of these things, fantastic. And, you know, through the history of even thinking about women's exercise and women's introduction into the realm of taking care of their bodies for health, a lot of that has been wrapped up and veiled in beauty being a virtue that women can achieve through exercise, for example. And I think you, you find that that's so insidious within wellness, whether it's through extreme diet culture veiled as healthy eating or orthorexia. It's so complex and it's so easily hidden in all of these aspects of wellness. Yeah, I, I call this patriarchy perfect. You got to look patriarchy perfect. Well, no, right? We recently had an event. We have this event several times a year, which is a global experience of women coming together to understand mm -hmm. patriarchy stress disorder and begin their healing journey. It's called the thriving experience. And at this event, I asked women, describe to me patriarchy perfect. It's like we all read the same books and the same magazines and we're exposed to the same things. Although women come from different backgrounds, different countries, different ages. And yet we all knew what patriarchy perfect was, right? So my sense is I don't have to explain that one. And, well, first of all, it is something that is an unachievable standard. And as you mentioned, it does, of course, support proliferation of all sorts of eating disorders. Uh, and just it has really messed up women's relationship with our bodies, but it goes deeper than the precepts of, like it didn't start with the wellness industry, right? but it is something that the wellness industry may be unconsciously perpetrating. When I talk about patriarchy stress disorder, I talk about the core wound for women is the wound of worthlessness. That our worth, the worth of our lives, our bodies, our ideas is less than men's. It, it's just a fact of patriarchy, right? We don't need to go far for proof of that. We can look at women's labor being unpaid. We can look at the pay gap for very concrete and tangible examples, and especially for women of color. And we can also look at, you know, how women are policed. Women's bodies are policed uh, on social, in the media, and even women who are in the public eye for their intellectual achievements, for the books mm -hmm. they've written, you know, they're still scrutinized for how they look because that is something that is, right, that the core value that patriarchy ascribed to a woman, basically, you got to look good. Like nobody cares. You just got to look good. You got to be patriarchy perfect. And that creates such a deep wound in our psyche, even if we don't consciously buy into that. Most women I know don't consciously buy into that, right? Like we know it's bullshit, but subconsciously it still torments us. It still creates this distance between us and our bodies where the body is still not our friend. We may still have this relationship with the body, trying to get it to some kind of a patriarchy perfect state. And it's all the more painful because we don't want to have that relationship, right? We want to be friends with our bodies. We want to love ourselves deeply and unconditionally. And it's super frustrating because even though we know it consciously and we don't buy into that consciously, but it still operates in us. And what's important to understand here is that what is operating in us is 
coming up from our subconscious. That's where the imprint of intergenerational trauma live. That's where the patriarchal prohibition lives on us fully being fully authentic and expressed and enjoying our lives. And we know from neuroscience that our actions are decided in our subconscious. So coming full circle to kind of the wellness industry and how we make decisions, if our actions are decided in our subconscious, then all of these buttons that are pushed through patriarchy perfect, the wellness industry pushes these buttons really, really well, we're going to respond to that, even if consciously we don't want to, right? So it's kind of a vicious cycle here. Again, like the wellness industry, I mean, wellness in and of itself, it is something that is a core value for so many of us. And patriarchy just has, as any system of oppression, has a tendency and a track record of hijacking absolutely everything, right? That starts as like a really good thing, and then it becomes something else, an instrument of oppression. Absolutely. And one thing that comes to mind when you say that is how consciously we've bought into self-care. So it's like self-care is the conscious choice of, oh, well, I need to do this to my body or eat this way because I'm taking care of myself and it's self-care. But then that becomes very easily commodified and then used as a weapon for, you know, moral judgments and a certain element of virtue signaling and control. And and then it becomes that self care or wellness is all about doing this type of yoga or drinking this kind of lemon water at this time of day. And I'm so curious what you think about the industry of quote unquote self care and how that's been kind of co-opted by patriarchy perfect in a way. Ooh, that just runs so deep. And again, like where do we distinguish between the good, right? That the the value that it actually brings and to where it becomes skewed and dangerous. Yeah, I, I just have chills because that's exactly what we talk about all the time, you know, on this podcast, but as colleagues, friends, coworkers, collaborators at this company, because it's such a fine line mm-hmm. to dance between and to engage with and to know what is conscious, what is unconscious, what is marketed to us. It's really tough. Yeah, to me, the answer or probably the direction of inquiry, if not the final answer, it lies in the in the direction of getting really, really in touch with our own sense. And to me, the body is that vehicle because the mind makes up stories. The mind, the mind is a meaning making machine. It will make up story one way or another. And as I've already shared, our actions are decided in our subconscious. So the mind is there to simply rationalize why we made this choice or another. But the body doesn't lie. So on the on the healing journey of uh, healing our traumas, both intergenerational and personal traumas, we're able to get deeper and deeper in touch with the body and with our authentic wisdom that is very embodied. And when I actually ask my body, well, is is this good for me? Is this what I actually want? I know some people might use body testing for that. Some people will use a different tool that is directly connected to their embodied intuition. And I will, when making these decisions, I always test with my, I just drop in the question, okay? Like A or B, this or that, like, or is, is, is this the direction that's right for me? And I'll get an immediate answer, right? Versus Versus, because I, I can also watch my buttons being pushed by, by, by different messaging and, and go, oh, okay, well, it would be so easy to make that choice because it's pushing my button of, well, I'm not good enough. Well, I gotta do X, Y, and Z oh. to be, you know, closer to patriarchy perfect. And those buttons are, you know, although I, I've been working on, on this for a while and I am the mother of, the PSD healing movement, it's, I mean, they, they're still there. I can watch them. The difference is that I can watch them. I can watch them being pushed and, I, and I'm and i not buying into that, right? But I'm still feeling that move in my system. Right? I can still feel the call, the call and response happening. And so I guess that's my distinction. That's what's been helpful to me, okay? What is my body saying versus 
what is my response to the buttons and the stories that the, the mind creates? So when you hear that term self-care or when you see things marketed as that, is that kind of what you're saying of how you approach it? Of Is this really authentically going to be good for me? Yeah, pretty much. You know, I am, I'm really open to all like input. I'm an avid learner. Like, okay, what, what's, what's happening here? What are the new discoveries? What are the new things people are doing? And I will run everything through my system, like drop that in. Okay. How does that feel? And my body will, will either like cringe in response and go, no, no, or, or will be like opening up to, oh, yeah, this is something to try. This is something that might maybe be good for you. As we're talking about, especially on this podcast, about the disintegration or the changing wellness industry, and sh- as we shift into a truly more integrated and holistic approach to our practices, whether it's in business or in community, how do you see that happening in ways you feel are really positive and In what ways do you think the recent messaging of the wellness industry has failed us? I'm just writing writing the Instagram feed kind of through my mind. Like, what have I seen lately? (laughs) There are so many. One that comes to mind is that we all have the same 24 hours in a day. Mm -hmm. And well... Where do we start? Let's take a look at somebody who has a disability and it takes them three hours to get ready and get out of the house and they, they need accommodations. They need to, they need to make calls to their insurance company. They need to make calls anywhere they go. They need to make sure is this accessible? You know, will I have accommodations? There's just so many things, a myriad things, right? That this person has to invest their time in they don't have a choice right it's not the same 24 hours in a day right you know in in the wellness area right so fatigue is is a hot topic right adrenal fatigue a lot of people struggle with that other other ways in which our energy is affected like if our energy is affected our focus is affected like no matter how hard we're trying to beat our body into submission Right? We're just not going to get the same out of the 24 hours. And so these are some damaging messages that they're really toxic, elitist, they're all, all sorts of, right? Just so many blind spots, I guess, in, in, in terms of, you know, we can look at literally any category, you know, is it income based? Is it based on race? Is it based on ability status? And there are probably a million other factors, right? Are you a parent? What are your life circumstances and situations? Everybody is so different. And another another one that, that carries similar poison, if I could do it, you can do it. If yeah. I could do it, you can do it. You know, if somebody who's who's been a size zero her entire life, like, is uh, promoting this message, like, Look, look how fit I am. If I could do it, you could do it. Yeah, yeah. all the fit spo on Instagram. Absolutely. <sighs> and it's just, again, it's just so cruel. Uh, and although people's intentions may be good, but it's mm-hmm. just when we are unconscious of something, right? We, we all have things we're unconscious of. Uh, I have things I'm unconscious of, and I'm constantly like trying to like shed the light into those blind spots. Uh, where do I have tunnel vision? Where am I not being like, inclusionary in my messaging and how I think and how I move through life. I mean, it's, I think it's really healthy, speaking of wellness, to be asking ourselves these questions. But speaking of wholeness, we're all in this together and we're all having very different experiences. So I guess anything that comes from the assumption that my experience kind of speaks for all experiences is difficult. And, and also the third, this third thing comes to mind is the idea of self-care. And it's so, so loaded. First of all, there is that Western bias that self-care is about self versus like there are voices that are talking about community care. And I think it's very beautiful, like emphasizing that we all need each other. I think pandemic has really disconnected us severely from community. And it's such a part of 
just what we need. We need this vitally. It has to be a part of self-care is being with others and taking care of others and letting others take care of ourselves and really being in this into being. And then there are so many things that like self-care has to look a certain way. Like going to a spa is self-care. Getting many petty is self-care, right? Mm-hmm. Also where it gets, it gets off track of what that actually means. Cause a lot of self-care is not something you can buy or sell. It's not something that can be marketed. It's this deep connection and relationship with yourself, with others, making space for things. And again, how other things, how how things play together, right? For some women who are so, and not only women, people across the gender spectrum, whose plates are just heaping with life stuff, who are just running, 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 and then hearing stuff about how, oh, yeah, you got to do more self-care. And they're like, where the F am I going to find time or energy for that, right? Or I can't afford this. So there are some poisons in the system for sure. And how to distinguish, again, between inspiration, right? Okay, like I can take a look at this. Maybe I can shift something in my life, right? Maybe I can incorporate some of these things. And where it's just like, oh, my gosh, this is so toxic. I wish I had not introduced that into my system, right? This is not inspiration. This is shaming and blaming and just makes me feel like shit, right? Yeah, it's reminding me of your patriarchy perfect and just the shame and guilt that really runs that system that, like you said, it it's so insidious. It just shows up everywhere. And it's unfortunate how quickly and easily it can show up in wellness, even if people have really good intentions, too. Like you mentioned, it's it's such a fine line. And to be able to be conscious of that and, and mm-hmm. check in with yourself. Yeah. And this is another thing that it often escapes, you know, it often kind of falls off their radar in terms of wellness. And I guess that just continuing the line about wellness in community to be truly well, we need to unpack our biases. We need to unpack white privilege as white people. We need to unpack those poisons that have been pre-installed mm-hmm. by oppressive systems, by patriarchy, by racism, by other oppressive systems. And this is big work. And to me, to be truly well, that's one of the key detox processes that we need to like detoxing, detoxing from all, yeah. all the set of green juice detoxing. Yeah. From both internalized oppression and the internalized oppressor and all, all sorts of shit that is just has been there in our society and in our lives, generation after generation after generation. And we have access now, which is completely unprecedented, online access to each other, to having conversations, to gathering as communities that we can really lean into. And I think it just makes it a big responsibility of this generation because we have this access. Like, what are we using this for? I was looking at what what needs to shift. And in a similar vein, like the wellness, our wellness, when we talk about self-care, but it's not integrated with the care of our planet. Mm -hmm. It's so individual. Yeah. Yeah. That is also right. That, that falls outside of what we can truly see as holistic. And, You know, again, this is not about, oh, my gosh, like I have it all figured out. No, God knows I I I don't. And it's and it's a challenging thing. And I think what is important in this conversation and unpacking this is, again, like removing the shame and blame so that they can be more curiosity and willingness to have conversations with each other without blaming. I think what, what has gone really, really off, especially during the pandemic. It's not even two sides. It's like sides within sides within sides within sides. And it's just like fractal. Yeah. And that introduces a lot of toxicity also. Like I, I, I think, I think honestly, looking through the lens of trauma and how much trauma has been activated for people during the pandemic, huge intergenerational trauma because it's not 
it's not our first rodeo on the planet of having pandemics, mortality. We, we lost people. We you know, people lost jobs, and you know just the amount of stress. All this trauma is activated. For for women, the trauma of losing choices, like women are losing choices again, like big time in so many ways. So many women left the workforce because they didn't have a choice. They had to take care of their kids. They had to take care of their parents. There's just so much intergenerational trauma activated, so much stress, and people just need to cope. And I honestly think that some of this polarization that is happening is is happening both out of people's desire to find community of like-minded people, because that's the instinct we need to reach for for each other. We need to bond. But also in these very stressful situations, there is the instinct of us against them. It's like it's the war. It's us against them. There's also something very deeply like that got activated there, that there's actually comfort, like this very bizarre comfort collectively in saying, well, I'm good, they're bad. Mm -hmm. It's a way to kind of bond and find community in a kind of misguided way. Yeah. And again, I don't think people are doing it consciously. I don't think no, it's our no. fault. I'm just, again, like observing what's coming up and observing my own system, like where it goes, right. like rabbit holes I go into when I scroll that feed. I'm like, who is not interesting, right? Mm-hmm. What, what yeah. the situation is revealing for us. Do you think because I would say, especially for marginalized non-binary folks and women, as patriarchy perfect relates to wellness, do you think that there's this interest and investment on some level because there's a certain sense of, oh, I can control my body, myself to a certain degree. So because that's all I can control in my life, because I feel so out of control in all these other areas, that that's what I'll do. Yeah, I think that's that's a valid point. We know uh, about kind of what's at the core of anxiety spectrum disorders and like eating disorders, upset, obsessions, compulsions, they all fall on the anxiety spectrum disorders. And there's a lot of anxiety up right now. I mean, it, there's so much uncertainty. There's so much collective anxiety. So people cope. We cope in all sorts of different ways, right? And having more control over something is is a way in which people cope. So yeah, one of the reasons I'm so committed to having trauma-informed conversations and, you know, showing people, okay, there's intergenerational trauma. That's what's up. That's what's affecting us is to bring compassion into the conversation. Self-compassion. Okay. The reason maybe I can't, you know, put down the spoon right now and the carton of hugging does. It's not because I, I am a failed person and I don't have willpower. Maybe it's because I have a lot in my system right now that I'm just overwhelmed and I need to numb, to dissociate, to disconnect from it. Because when we know it, we can bring compassion to it. And when we can bring compassion to it, we actually have more choices. We're not as stuck in these patterns. And it may still be the same choice. It may be a different choice, right? But removing judgment out of it, I feel, really gets us off the hook of just being in the hamster wheel, right? Yeah, absolutely. It brings you out of the unconscious cycle Mm -hmm. and, and spin. With where we're at in the pandemic right now in 2022, how do you think PSD or patriarchy perfect is showing up mostly and how can we bring that consciousness to, and compassion to help our communities? Well, PSD, I, I think, is exacerbated just like everything else just because there's just so much more stress, so much other layers of trauma that are activated. And in terms of how it shows up, I mean, it shows up in the classic ways that I've described in my book that go from, you know, how it shows up in the mind through the imposter syndrome and the inner critic and the mental fog and distractions and a lack of clarity, like all these things that are meant as trauma defenses to keep women, quote unquote, safe, aka out of our power, out of our power, stepping into our 
actually true authentic power right so if you're thinking oh yeah you know i just need to manage my thoughts so it goes deeper than that because it's not only the mind that is affected because these trauma defenses they affect the whole system they can show up in the body through health expressions because uh unprocessed trauma creates such a level of stress in our system that constant state of hypervigilance it can mm-hmm. translate into fatigue it can translate into trouble sleeping trouble restoring even if we manage to sleep it can translate into stress addiction right that scrolling that instagram feed or you know just constantly checking email checking news things that actually keep us stressed even watching shows that keep our nervous system in a state of activation but we call it relaxation right so it's showing up in different expressions of the body chronic pains and anxiety depressions they start as trauma adaptations anxiety is a hypervigilance response with the energy spiraling up depression is more of a freeze response with the energy spiraling down and if it's not addressed they just become their own thing they become conditions that are more stable in our system and in actions in our actions in our choices these expressions of uh, PSD these trauma defenses that come with it may show up as addictive behaviors as self sabotage whenever there is a quote unquote threat of expansion whenever th- there is wow. a threat of success there is a threat of more money there is a threat of greater intimacy and more mm-hmm. visibility and connection and even wellness and oh, even yeah. right there's feeling really good in in the body in the body and mind and the whole system and it's it's counterintuitive why would that feel unsafe well because it has been prohibited and punishable for women under patriarchy forever forever mm-hmm. and ever So here is a fine line right on the one hand the pandemic made it all a lot more obvious and things that we used to tolerate have become truly intolerable and that is a call to action that is a call to healing for sure and on the other side the pandemic has also exhausted has exhausted us to where we have very little energy or will or time for action So we're in a very interesting place now. And what I can say is trauma healing tools, the tools that help us restore our nervous system are very very relevant now especially so that we can not only survive the, these circumstances but actually use this as an opportunity to open up thriving in our mm-hmm. systems. I really really use this as a kind of a rupture in the fabric of the status quo where we can like make a quantum leap right from surviving to thriving where our nervous system begins to interpret visibility success connection wealth wellness as safe and that comes with rewiring the nervous system that comes with reprogramming the subconscious that's something i talk about the in the book and that we go into at the thriving experience at our live interactive experience where women have a chance to not just have conversation about it but actually shift this in their bodies oh i'm just covered in goosebumps <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting I I feel like the nervous system regulation feels like a very hot thing right now which is positive that's a really positive shift and I know that's something that really you illuminated for me in your work mm-hmm. that I wasn't aware of that you know that I was constantly in that hyper vigilant place and I think we're so used to that as being a baseline yeah. of constant stimulation Yeah, absolutely. And like fish and water, it just feels normal. It feels normal. In my book, I start with sharing my story of ending up in the emergency room mm-hmm. where the left side of my body went offline because of stress, but I felt normal. Wallace, I felt that level of stress felt 
normal to me. Right. And unfortunately, I know I'm not alone, that it is pretty normal in our culture. So having these conversations, thank you for your work. Thank you for bringing these conversations to people. Because that, that literally, like these conversations can save lives and have lives change their trajectory, not only for the person listening, but for their entire environment, for their families, for their communities. And uh, to me, that's that's what it's all about. That's the opportunity that we have right now. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better. 